Yep. All right. We're live. Do we have people? Yes. All um, right. Welcome in, everybody. Thank you for coming out to today's program with the Queen's Historical Society. My name is Jaron Halfpath. I'm the Education and Outreach Coordinator here at the Queen's Historical Society, and we're here at Kingsland today to bring you a special program about the historic houses here in Queens uh, to help promote uh, Rob Mackay, one of our board members, uh, news books about uh, historic houses here in Queens. So what better backdrop than to do it here in Kingsland? So I think without further ado, I think we should head over to Rob Mackay and see what he has to say about his new book. Hi, Rob. Hi, how are you? Um, before I start, I just want to say thanks to everyone who's here. I know it's sort of the first real beach day of the summer, so I'm very, uh, I, I really appreciate the fact that you're taking time uh, to, to consume this, this podcast, video cast, whatever modern technology it is. And a special thanks to you too, Jaron, uh, you, for doing all the, all the, the tech work in, in the background. Um, as, uh, as, as Jaron said, my name is in fact Rob Mackay. Uh, and I am a board member uh, here at the Queens Historical Society. Uh, I work for the, the Queens Economic Development Corporation. Uh, and in that job, I run the Queens Tourism Council. Uh, I raise my kids in Queens. I got married in Queens. I live in Queens. There's a, there's a Queens theme. Um, and uh, I've always been very interested in history. Uh, and uh, and I'm, I'm fascinated by, by Queen, this borough that we have here. Uh, there's just nothing like it. It seems like every single day I learn something new about something in this borough that all that just amazes me. Uh, and so I get a lot of inspiration in this borough. Uh, and uh, when uh, I guess if we would go back to two marches ago, either February or March, when it became obvious that uh, COVID was here to stay, I knew that my job specifically, since I do a lot of tourism promotion, was was about to go sort of into hibernation or on hiatus. And so I came up with the idea uh, that I'd write a book about all the wonderful things in Queens. And uh, it would I would write it during the pandemic, pandemic during COVID. Uh, then uh, it would publish when, when COVID is over, people would have all this pent up energy, they'd read the book, they'd go and do all the stuff uh, that I'd written about and it would be a great way to promote the borough. Uh, so, but I, I, and I pitched it to Arcadia Publishing which uh, historians, uh, if any, any of the audience, uh, you know, reads uh, history books, they're, they're, Arcadia Publishing is the, 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 a very, very prolific publisher of, uh, of historic books. And they focus on, they mostly like to do communities, but they'll also do historic trends and historic buildings and stuff like that. Uh, and I pitched it, uh, I, you know, I want to write about the museums and everything. And they came back to me and said, um, well, you can write this, but it has to be about the historic houses and historic houses only. If some of them are still open as museums, that's fine, uh, but you have to write about historic. Everything has to be historic, historic, historic. And so I accepted. Uh, and then the, the next step uh, with Arcadia is that they, they have a formula. They have, you have to have at least 180 photos or images in each book. Uh, and uh, they have, they're very, very, actually, they have, they have really high standards about the photos. Uh, it's really hard when you're looking for vintage photos to find quality ones, uh, especially anything that's before about 1880. Uh, but they, uh, they demand 180 minimum and they demand uh, high quality on all of them. And so uh, I set out to find uh, how, uh, photos that, that, that could fit the formula. And what we ended up with was they rejected about 40 of my photos and they accepted 200. So this book uh, contains 200 photos or images. Some of them are not of houses. Some of them, some of them are inside houses. Some of them are maps, et cetera. Uh, and then there are captions that go along uh, and explain what you're seeing with the, with the photos and uh, whatnot. Um, and uh, so it's, it's exactly that. It's, it's 200 photos with captions on about 140 pages because so, most of the pages have, have two photos. Uh, and 
uh, Queens. I, I ended up learning so much about it, became so fascinated by it. Thanks for coming. Um, uh, that I'm, I, you know, it was this, this, this book was a lot of work, uh, uh, but I am so happy that I did it. Uh, and, and, uh, I will never, ever regret it. That's for sure. Uh, most of the photos, if you, uh, if you're interested in that are, uh, by, uh, I got them from the direct source. For example, a historic house would give me their photos, or sometimes I would literally knock on doors and, and meet people and say, hey, do you, you know, tell me about your historic house that you live in. I also got photos from the Library of Congress, which has, has a lot of good stuff, which is free. Queens Public Library has a lot of good stuff. And there are other things like the New York State Archives is good. Uh, there's the New York City Municipal Archives and stuff. So the photos are almost all that. Um, and then they also, uh, Arcadia has an 80-20 rule, which is that 80% of the photos have to be old or vintage and 20% can be new. So there are a lot of photos that I took um, of modern day photos of, of these old historic houses. Uh, so that's basically that's basically what's inside. Uh, it's The book is organized in 10. Uh, see, this is another thing, another negotiation with Arcadia. I said, let's just start with the oldest house and go straight to the newest. And they said, no, it has to be in 10 chapters. And you start uh, at the north port part of Queens, and then you go around clockwise uh, covering uh, houses like that. So we start in East Elmhurst, and then we kind of go Flushing and Palace Point and Bayside, and then we go out to like the, the Eastern Queens houses, and then we swing around with the Rockaways, and then we go back up and we hit Forest Hills, and we end in, uh, with Astoria. Uh, uh, so that's, that's basically how it goes. The book starts in East Elmhurst and it goes around uh, back to East Elmhurst. It starts and ends in East, El East Elmhurst. Um, so that's that's basically the book. It's Arcadia Publishing and we, we played it straight on the name, Historic Houses of Queens. We didn't do anything funny, just said, hey, it's a book on the Historic Houses of Queens. We'll call it the Historic Houses of Queens. Um, so now uh, that's basically what's inside and that's kind of the story behind it. Uh, like I said, the hard part was getting the photos there's so much information out there, especially if a house has applied to and or received uh, landmark status. And you can get city with landmark status, state, federal. There's the National Register of Historic Places. And if you, you can find a lot of information about these actual uh, uh, houses. So that wasn't really a problem. The problem was the photos. And then I actually, they also have another rule, which I, I think it's, if you use two photos on a page, you can use 140 words. If you use one, you can use 180. And so I actually have to cut. There's so much more information on these houses that's out there that I got, which I think is interesting. But I ended up cutting it out because they have uh, had to match their, their formula. Um, so well, having said that, uh, here is the first photo. Um, Jaron, everyone can see this, right? Okay. Okay. Uh, so what you're looking at there on the front page, uh, you're actually, uh, what, what you're looking at right now is basically Terminal A uh, of LaGuardia Airport. Uh, if you know how LaGuardia is set up, there's terminals B, C, and D on one side, and then there's A all the way on the east. That house uh, no longer exists. It burned down in a fire, uh, but it, uh, it, it it's was owned by a very prominent family called the Rikers. And if you're saying, oh, the Rikers, is that like Rikers Island? And the answer is yes. Uh, they owned Rikers Island and then they owned a bunch of land, uh, basically where East Elmhurst and, uh, and uh, part of LaGuardia Airport are. They, that house was, it became, when they became wealthy and, and prominent, they built that mansion. That photo, by the way, is from 1920. Uh, um, the Rikers lived there for several centuries. Uh, but the, the, the interesting thing about this is that if you were to go maybe two football fields to the east of where this land is right now, okay, uh, you will find this house, which is referred to most often as the Lent Riker Smith Homestead. And this is the oldest house in all of New York City that a person still lives in. I guess another way to phrase that would be to say it is the oldest private dwelling in the United States. There are older structures, but they've been turned into museums or other stuff. And a woman still lives there today. 
Uh, it's called the Lent Riker Smith uh, how, uh, Homestead because uh, a man named Abraham Riker, now he spelled his name R-Y-C-K-E-R, came over from a town called Lent in Holland. And Peter Stuyvesant was the ruler. I can't really call him the mayor. He was really the ruler at the time uh, he, of New York City. He granted uh, Abraham Riker this land. So we're talking, we're talking about 1650, a little bit before 1650. And he wrote, he started, he built this house. It started as just a one room house where he had his farm uh, and uh, they built, built over it and on it as, uh, as they went by. Now that photo right there is about a hundred years ago uh, old. Uh, it's, uh, it's on a property, uh, it's really kind of crazy. It's, it's East Helmers. So uh, where that property stands is, it's a stone's throw, literally a stone's throw to use the terminology they might've used back then to the causeway that leads to Rikers Island where the prison is. Uh, the Rikers, you know, they had farmland on both the island and uh, East Elmhurst and they would go back and forth by canoe. Uh, in, in the book, there's actually a, a drawing of, of the canoe and going back and forth to Rikers Island. Um, uh, but the Rikers lived in this house for uh, several hundred years. Uh, and even though this is the oldest house in all of New York City and it dates to 16, about 1650, it was kind of built over a couple of years around 1650. It's only had three different owners, three families that are owned, that have owned it. Um, the, uh, the Rikers, when they got out uh, in the, uh, basically in the early part of the 1900s, they sold it to their family's accountant. He lived there for a long time uh, and then he sold it to uh, a man named Smith. Smith married a woman named Marion Duckworth Smith, who still lives there, and she still gives tours if you want to. She's um, she's 82 or 83, and she was fantastic with me. She took me in. She showed me everything about the house, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of fascinating things about the house. Uh, for example, uh, this is this is East Elmer. So basically, you've got an airport on one side, and you've got kind of suburban track housing all around it. And then all of a sudden you have this house right here uh, and it has a, uh, it has a, a graveyard with um, people that are buried there. Almost all the last names are Riker uh, starting in the, the graveyard start in the 1700s. Uh, uh, there's, there's one guy that says he died in Valley Forge um, uh, fighting the American revolution. Um, and so it was a, uh, it, it's got all this history to it. This right here uh, is from her, this is, uh, they used to call this, I believe, a holding, the holding room. It's, uh, this was the first thing that they built. Uh, it's, uh, they would have their fire there and they would sleep in the same room uh, uh, to stay warm at night and all that. Uh, they, they must've had a lot of problem with smoke inhalation, but this is the original thing. And like I said, you can go on tours. Um, uh, the, the, uh, this is what the house looks like right now. Uh, as you can see, it's absolutely beautiful. Uh, the woman, Marion Duckworth Smith, she has uh, done a renovation. It's been many, many years, uh, but she can tell you all about it. When she was doing the renovation, she went up in the attic and she found all of these old games and, and old uh, like ledgers and stuff uh, that, that uh, the kids probably played with in, uh, in the 1700s and the 1800s. Uh, and uh, as you can see, it's, it's basically a, a Dutch style, uh, the, the whole gambrel roof and all that. Um, and uh, the other kind of interesting thing about this is that there, there are 132 graves in the cemetery. Uh, and uh, Marion Duckworth Smith's husband is buried there, uh, right? There are all these old crypts, old tombstones that are almost worn out from, from rain and stuff. And you can hardly read what it says. And then there's a modern one where her husband is buried. Her mother and her sister are buried too. And she has it in her will that when she dies, she wants to be buried on the property. Um, she has a daughter, but the daughter lives in, in California, and I don't think it's too interested in the whole place. So she, um, I don't know what's going to happen when she's going to die. I, I hope someplace like the Queen's Historical Society takes it over. Uh, maybe the city might take it over. Maybe the state might take it over. Who knows? Um, but it is a true chat treasure, um, uh, and it's definitely worth seeing. Uh, so the next photo, see, again, like I said, we started in East Elmhurst, and we, then we started going to make the clock. That right there is where Malcolm X lived. And uh, I'm not sure, if, uh, I guess a lot of people know that, but Al Malcolm X lived in that house right there. It's on East Elmhurst. Uh, you can go there today. Uh, it's, uh, it's a privately owned house. 
Uh, and if uh, I don't know if you've read the book or seen the movie, but there uh, he was uh, with the Nation of Islam, and he was preaching at the mosque that they had in Harlem. Uh, and he while he was preaching at the the mosque there, he was living there in East Elmhurst, and he got in a fight when he was separating with uh, with the Na Nation of Islam. They wanted the house. He said it was his. Uh, they said, no, you're no longer working for us. He said, no, it was a gift, blah, blah, blah. And uh, it was attacked uh, early one morning. Um, uh, and uh, Molotov cocktails were thrown in. Malcolm X was sleeping there with his kids. Uh, and this is a, a photo taken right after of the attack. Uh, he was actually um, killed just a, a couple of days after that. So they, I think they were pretty much out together. Uh, I, I'm happy to say that four of Malcolm X's children were actually born in Queens, uh, which uh, which is, can be the cause for pride for some of us. Um, and then here is what it looks like now. Uh, I've knocked on the door. The people live in there are very friendly, but they have no uh, desire to sell it or, or turn it into a museum. There have been efforts to uh, landmark it that haven't um, been successful and you know, artistically or architecturally, it's really nothing special. I mean, it's got a nice seafoam green right there, um, but uh, it hasn't got that. There was a council member named Hiram Montserrat about 20 years ago, and he got on the corner of that street, uh, There's a he got a plaque that says Malcolm X Place, and you can actually see that, but it does not have historic, uh, uh, it doesn't have a historic status from any kind of an agency. Um, and uh, it's just a sort of a, a, a place in history. Uh, it's, uh, but it's always fun to go out there. You see a lot of people go out there to take photos in front of there. Uh, now, there again, we're, we're, we're heading, the, 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 the clock is ticking. So we've gone from East Elmhurst to Corona as uh, we're heading. Uh, well, we're really, really what we're doing is we're heading east. Um, that is Louis Armstrong's house. Uh, everyone, Louis Armstrong, everyone always talks about how he was from New Orleans. You go to New Orleans and everything down there is Louis Armstrong. The, the airport is named after him. Everything's Louis Armstrong. But the only place that he ever owned property uh, was, in fact, in this house right here in Corona. Um, it's uh, a museum. Uh, maybe people that are here have, have toured it. Uh, it's because of COVID. It, it's been a little bit sort of dormant recently. Uh, but they are actually right across the street. They are going to, there are plans to build a large visitor center, which will include a, a concert hall um, for, for jazz musicians. Uh, the inch, there are a couple of interesting things about this house. Aside, uh, Louis Armstrong was always traveling. He's always on the road. Uh, his wife, his fourth wife, Lucille, uh, who was born Lucille Wilson, she was actually a dancer at the, the Cotton Club in Harlem. She bought this house when he was on tour. And so he actually never saw it until he moved in. And uh, he flew into the airport. He gave the address to the cab driver. And the cab driver drove him here, dropped him off, and said, OK, this is your house. And they said, are you sure? <laughs> he didn't believe it. Uh, but he absolutely loved it. Um, and he cherished his time there. Looking at these two photos, uh, the, the one on the left is uh, it's, it's important. Uh, it's Louis Armstrong and his stoop. Now, as, as I said, Louis Armstrong was always traveling, always, you know, working nights. And he used to spend really, uh, really, really like cherished free time on the stoop uh, with his wife, usually relaxing, uh, watching the children, just, you know, just doing it back then, you know, before air conditioner, et cetera, et cetera. You, you would hang out on your stoop. Uh, and uh, there's the song, What a Wonderful World, where he says, uh, uh, the children, uh, they more know more than I'll ever know. I see skies of blue, the children that he was not actually going to sing that song. It was actually written for somebody else, uh, but he loved it so much because it reminded him of his time on the stoop um, that he, 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 he agreed. He signed the contract to sing it. Um, so next time you hear what a wonderful world, just think about Louis Armstrong and his wife, Lucille, uh, on their on the, on their stoop. Uh, passing their cherished free Saturday or free Sunday uh, with kids and talking to people in the neighbors. Their next door neighbor was, was absolutely their best friend, a woman named Selma. In fact, when she died, she do donated her house to the Armstrong House Museum. So you can actually go into hers. 
Now, the, the photo on the, the right is, uh, it's kind of funny, but it also kind of tells a story. Uh, Louis Armstrong, uh, as we knew, he grew up poor uh, in, 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 in Harlem, uh, in, in, sorry, in, in, in New Orleans. And he went through, his father left for a while, his mom was sick for a while. He was in a, what, what they called back then, a, a home for a waif home or a, a place for, for not kind of homeless children. Um, and uh, he had a lot of, uh, he never really ate good food. Uh, he, uh, and he always had intestinal problems. And so the minute he got enough money, uh, he built himself the best bathroom that money could buy at the time. And that, uh, that photo right there is actually taken from a magazine spread. Uh, they, uh, they said, hey, can we do an article on any of you? And he said, sure, let's do it on my bathroom. <laughs> um, but uh, to give you an idea of what that has, it has uh, floor-to-ceiling mirrors, onyx features, a marble bathtub, gold-plated faucets in the form of swans on a marble sink. That marble sink was once a bird bath in France. He brought it over from France. He also added speakers um, uh, so he could listen to music, uh, and he was very, very proud of that. Uh, so uh, I, I included that there. And let me also say that Okay, yes, the, uh, the COVID has been tough, but the, um, the, that house museum, it's called the Louis Armstrong House Museum, is still there. You can still visit it. And um, Louis died first. When his wife, Lucille, died, she gave it to the city. And so no one else has lived there. So the house is completely uh, the way it was uh, when they lived there. So it gives you a real, a real shot, a real, real sort of understanding of, of how Louis spent his, uh, his private time. So one of the most public figures ever, but this is where he spent his private life. Uh, moving along. So we're uh, at, I, as I sit here, we're in Kingsland Homestead, which is one of the historic houses of Queens. It's also the headquarters for the Queens Historical Society. So I didn't include anything about Qu Kingsland Homestead because I figured that people on this call would know, um, probably know more than I do. But that right there is the Bowen House. Uh, and um, it, uh, it's on the National Register of Historic Places. It's also the oldest domicile in Queens, meaning the oldest place where people lived. Uh, however, it's not a private dwelling like the Riker House that we talked about earlier. So it, it, the Riker House is where a private dwelling, this is another museum that you can visit. Uh, something tells me that uh, most of the people know about John Brown, Brown uh, that he was a Quaker, um, that, or that he, that he was in, he allowed Quakers to meet in that house at a time when uh, the Dutch Reformed Church was the only allowed religion. Peter Stuyvesant only allowed uh, 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 people to practice one religion. It was not a democracy back then in the 1600s. Uh, John Bowne actually went to exile. He was exiled for allowing Quakers to, uh, to practice there. Uh, and the Flushing Remonstrance, uh, which is a, a basically a declaration of uh, we demand rights for religious freedom, was written, discussed, and uh, in, in the Bowne House. Um, and uh, of course, uh, the Bound House. Uh, some people say that the that the Flushing Remonstrance uh, was the base for the, the the civil the Bill of Rights in the Constitution. Um, the uh, it's also important to say that Quakers and Flushing Quakers in general and Flushing uh, more specifically was always violent. Were, were very very uh, anti-slavery. They were abolitionists. And that house right there, the Bound House, which still exists. Um, uh, has a place where they would, it was a stop on the Underground Railroad, an end stop on the Underground Railroad, uh, and escaped slaves would live there, uh, and sometimes they would hide there from bounty hunters that would come up. Uh, so it's a, um, it's a, it's really a piece of history for many, many different reasons. Uh, also, kind of like the Rikers House, the Bounds lived there for nine generations. Uh, they were there, so they, they were there for many, many years, uh, and the house has all kinds of, uh, it has all kinds of the, you know, whether it's art or, or furniture and stuff that the family collected over the years and years. Uh, so staying in Flushing, and then we'll get out of Flushing, but this is, uh, this is the Quaker Meeting House. Uh, if you look in the, to the left in the background, you'll see what, what now is Northern Boulevard. Uh, and the, um, the Quaker Meeting House was actually uh, built on land that was donated by John Bowne. 
who was mentioned in the who's in the first thing, and he actually helped finance and build the uh, that friends meeting house. Uh, it is in Quaker style. It's simple, nothing fancy. Um, it's a two-story wooden frame frame building. Uh, you uh, with the the entrance is on the not on the street side because you're supposed to be looking within. Uh, it is the uh, it is the oldest structure in New York State that has been continuously used for religious purposes. Uh, now there is one thing to that. Uh, during the uh, American Revolution, the British actually occupied it, but they they still allowed um, uh, Quaker services. And the British actually uh, they used the, the the wooden pews inside uh, for wood for for heat basically. Uh, and um, so the inside uh, actually has furniture that was not quite as old as the house uh, because of that, that uh, occupation. Um, and right from, from where this photo was taken uh, is the a cemetery, a Quaker cemetery. Uh, the, the thing about Quakers is that in the beginning, they didn't believe in putting your name on, on tombstones. And then, in, then they finally got to a point where they allowed your initials to be put on uh, the cemetery. So if you walk around there, you'll see a lot of blank tombstones and tombstones with just initials on it. But uh, it is believed that some of the most prominent early Quakers uh, were, are buried there, including uh, the Hicks family. If you know Hicksville in Long Island, uh, the Hickses uh, are buried there. And, and it's also believed that, that the John Bown uh, is buried there as well. Um, so uh, it's also nice to know that this is both on the National Register of Historic Places and it's also a New York City landmark. And, um, you know, you can argue why is this in the historic houses of Queens? And I thought about it because it really it is, it, they call it a, a meeting house and people did live there uh, during the um, during the, the American Revolution. And it's, so, it's such a gem uh, for anyone who loves history. So I included it in here, uh, but it is uh, still open. The Quaker, they still have, have what I would call a service. They would call a meeting uh, they, on, on, on Sundays. They're still very involved in the community um, and, and anyone can take a tour there and anyone can join uh, uh, if it, anyone is a Quaker. Uh, moving right along. Now, if anybody knows the U-Haul building, uh, the, uh, right along Flushing River and Flushing, there is a, a big U-Haul, uh, a structure that says U-Haul. Now, where that is right now is where this, um, this uh, mansion, which was once called Willow Bank, used to stand. Now, the, it's basically, I guess you would call it College Point Boulevard that runs through there. Um, and it was the, uh, owned by the, the Lawrence family. And the Lawrence family is one of the, uh, the, the, the most prominent old families in both Queens and Long Island history. Uh, there's a Lawrence town in, in, um, in Long Island that's the same family. Uh, and uh, in fact, what is now College Point Boulevard used to be called uh, Lawrence Avenue. And the neighborhood College Point used to be called uh, Lawrence Neck, uh, and it all dates back to a guy named William Lawrence, who was born in England in 1623. He came over actually as a pilgrim. He was uh, in the Plymouth Colony in Massachusetts, but he couldn't get into the Puritan lifestyle. So he, uh, he ended up in Flushing, uh, where he got a uh, several hundred acre land grant Now, in 1645 from the governor of the time, who was a guy named William Kieft, which would obviously be a Dutch last name. And they lived there and farmed there for years and years. Uh, the original house that they had burned down, but then um, a guy in, in 1846, a guy named John Watson Lawrence, uh, who was the great grandson of the original one, uh, built that mansion right there. Uh, and it had, it had a, a great sta staircase entrance and square columns, a large window with the family crest um, uh, it, uh, it, it, they were passionate about horticulture. So you can see on the side, there's a really big uh, green room or greenhouse. Um, uh, and then what happened was uh, an heir uh, got involved in Wall Street and started spending more and more time uh, in, in Manhattan and finally just was, not, was no longer uh, interested in it. Um, so in 1924, uh, he sold the estate to a developer who demolished it. 
Uh, factories opened up there in 1979, uh, oh, until 1979 when U-Haul uh, purchased it. So the next time you're driving by the, the Flushing River and you see the U-Haul building with that uh, clock tower, that's, that's where this Willow Bank used to live. Um, and thundering right along. All right, College Point. Uh, the person you see on the left was uh, really a fantastic, fa fascinating guy. His name is Conrad Poppenhusen, and he was actually born in, in uh, Hamburg, Germany. There was a big fire. He was born in 1818. There was a big fire uh, in Hamburg, and he ended up, he and his wife uh, fled to New York, and he, he started uh, vulcanizing rubber. Uh, and he had a factory first in Manhattan, and then he moved out to College Point, which was basically the Winderland, uh, which was basically a, the Wild West at the time. Uh, and uh, he's very, very successful. And he basically, out of his own pocket, he paved the streets, he brought in gas lines, he brought in, um, uh, he, he, he made, a, uh, made them build a, uh, a Long Island Railroad station there. He built parks. He, he, there's a library there. There's a, a place called the Poppenhusen Institute, which still exists today. Uh, it's like a big community center. Um, uh, and uh, he brought all of his workers uh, there. So it was kind of like a company town. He built their houses and they worked in his factories. And the neighborhood was called Little Heidelberg uh, because it was so Germany. It's, it, it's so German. It's now called uh, College Point, of course. The mansion right there is where he lived. Unfortunately, it doesn't stand anymore, but there is a, there, there are streets that you can see the Poppenhusen name uh, in streets, parks, libraries, the Poppenhusen Institute. Um, and the other thing that I think is really, really interesting about this uh, is um, Germans were, were coming to that neighborhood for a long time. And uh, there's a book that a guy who grew up in, in College Point wrote about German Americans who fought World War I. And basically at the time, College Point had two German language newspapers uh, and everyone, they would speak German, the whole culture was German, but they're all Americans. And uh, a lot of these Germans, German Americans that were born here, before they went into World War I, they had got parades through College Point where umpa bands would sing songs in German, and then they would go and fight, fight the Germans because they were completely American identified. Uh, but the language and the culture in College Point was German for a very long time, even though they were also Americans. Um, this right here is, uh, it's called the castle uh, and it's in Fort Totten. It was originally the officers mess hall and club and it was built for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in 1887. However, now it is, uh, everyone calls it the castle, and it's actually the headquarters for the Bay Bayside Historical Society. Uh, it's in Fort Totten, which is a military base on the exact, the, like sort of the definition of northeastern tip uh, of Queens and Bayside. Uh, right next to it, there, there used to be uh, all kinds of other military barracks. Um, because it was, a, it was a, a true fort. We trained Union forces during the Civil War. There was a barracks, there was a prison, there was an ar uh, armory, there was a parade grounds. Uh, there were places where the, 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 the troops would pass muster, et cetera, et cetera. It goes on like that. Um, but uh, uh, it's now, it, it passed on to becoming a, a New York City landmark in 1974. Uh, and Fort Totten has pretty much been converted by the New York City Parks Department, which owns it. It's a 49.5 uh, acre public park. It has a baseball diamond, uh, a couple actually, a public swimming pool, all kinds of soccer fields and other stuff. Uh, but you can still go visit that. Uh, it is the Bay Hill, Bay, Bayside Historical Society. They put on all kinds of um, exhibitions and, and talks like the one that's going on right here. Uh, I've been to them before. It's a fantastic place that obviously was, uh, plays a large part in American history. Um, that right there, the next photo that you're seeing right there is, uh, it's now the, the, the Douglaston Club uh, at Douglas Manor. So we we're kind of, Douglas, Douglas Manor, as you know, where you're just about to hit Long Island. So we're, we're heading far out. Uh, that, uh, the Douglas Manor, they bought that. It's, it's, uh, it's a three-story Greek revival mansion uh, basically, the, the, the Van Zants and the Wicks were, were some of the big, and the Lawrences were some of the, and the Cornells were some of the big landowners 
in uh, what's now Douglas Manor. Um, and uh, this, what you're seeing right there was uh, part of the, the Douglas family, which is where you get Douglas Manor from. Uh, they own that. They, they're, they're famous for that, that house right there was on their, their property. They're famous uh, because William P. Douglas, he had a yacht called Sappho that won the America's Cup in 1871, the first yacht, first American yacht to win a, 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 a America's Cup race. I think it was called something uh, else that. Um, but the, uh, they sold the Douglaston Club, which is now a private club, they bought that property uh, in 1921. And it's still, it's a clubhouse inside. It's very beautiful. It's got great food. And right next to it, there, is, there are some tennis courts. There's a large pool. Uh, you can look down uh, in, into, the, uh, into the, the, what is, I guess, I guess that's Little Neck Bay, right? Um, but it's one of the few, it's one of the, the remaining, uh, Douglas Manor has a lot of beautiful buildings, uh, but that, that's one of them. Um, now, going on, this is one of the uh, unsung, if you'll pardon the pun, this is one of the unsung neighborhoods of Queens, uh, Addisley Park. Uh, Addisley Park is basically, it's actually a historic district in uh, is it St. Albans, Saint, Saint, Southeast Queens, if uh, Linden Boulevard, if that means anything. Uh, and it was uh, at one time known as Black Hollywood East because so many prominent African-Americans in the entertainment business uh, lived there. Uh, the, on the left is the house where James Brown used to live. Um, at the time when he was there, it actually had a moat and a bridge and there was a, a wall on the outdoors and he had big JB on it. Um, and to the right is Ella Fitzgerald's house. Um, she, uh, she lived there uh, starting, I believe in eight, 1949. Um, and a whole bunch of other prominent people. I think, I, yep, okay, I had to include this, uh, including Jackie Robinson to the left. That house right there is where Jackie Robinson lived. Uh, the, and to the right uh, is a, uh, a mural uh, that depicts all the famous people that lived there. Uh, to give you an idea, some of the other people, uh, Jackie Robinson was, I believe, someone would have to correct me. I think he started out at second base and ended up at first base first African-American to play in the Major League Baseball, uh, Brooklyn Dodgers. Uh, his, the catcher on that team, who was one of the, also one of the first African-Americans to play in the Major League Baseball was Roy Campanella. He lived right there. Um, so did W.E.B. Dubois lived there and got married there. Uh, if, you, if you like jazz, Illinois Jacket lived there. Uh, Lena Horne lived there. Billy Holiday lived there. John Coltrane lived on Mexico Street, which is just outside of the historic district. Um, and uh, they, uh, the houses there are beautiful. There, it, it was built, it, it was farmland until they, they built a, a Long Island Railroad station and then they became golf clubs and then the golf club people sold and it became uh, houses. And because it was built in sort of like the 1920s and 1930s, and some of the architecture that was big at the time was there, including arts and crafts, uh, Mediterranean, neoclassical prairie. You know, arts and crafts is like when you would put different kinds of, of, of styles in the same house. Um, but uh, the houses, they're, they're, they're all back. They're, 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 they have to be a certain amount of uh, feet from the sidewalk and stuff. So the, the neighborhood is absolutely beautiful. It's full of green, uh, well-kept lawns and, and really beautiful houses. Uh, it also has a kind of an interesting history in that when it was built in the 1920s, there were covenants that didn't allow uh, white, the owners to sell to non-white people. The, uh, the neighbor was mostly Irish, Italian, and, and Jewish. And uh, Black people started living there sort of on the down low. Uh, Fats Waller, uh, who you might know from, uh, he wrote Eight Misbehaving. Uh, he wrote, uh, you know, I'm just mad about my baby and my baby's mad about me. He was the first one to buy a house there. Uh, and uh, it actually led to some court cases uh, where they finally, the federal judge, federal court finally decided that uh, you could not uh, make it illegal to sell your property to black people, that that was a, a, a violation of the constitution. Um, anyway, uh, there are still a lot of prominent people that live there. I, I don't think there are any that were that, that famous uh, as there was back in the day, really, which is kind of like the 1940s, 50s, 60s. Um, I, I don't know if you know Joe Lewis, the boxer, he lived there. Lester Young, if you, if you like jazz, he lived there. 
Um, Brooke Benton, another jazz great. He also lived there. Um, Mercer Ellington, again, if you like, uh, Mercer Ellington was the son of Duke Ellington. Uh, he lived there. Um, and uh, I have, unfortunately, I have a, um, a pretty good photo of Jackie Robinson, his wife and, and his son sitting in front of that, that house. Um, but it, there's, a co- there's a copyright problem, so I couldn't share it. I couldn't include it in the book. But anyway, they said that there, there were so many gawkers, people that came by to see his house, that he ended up moving to Connecticut because it just made him go crazy. Uh, he, needed, he needed some privacy. Um, okay, uh, the next house is the Adrian's Farmhouse on a beautiful winter day. As you can see, uh, it looks, if you look at the door, you'll see, hey, it looks like it was Christmas time. The Adrian's uh, Farmhouse is located where the Queens County Farmhouse, uh, Queens County Farm Museum is today. Um, they're actually having a big uh, blo- apple blossom carnival going on today. Uh, it's also right near where Creedmoor is. Uh, technically, I guess the neighborhood is Glen Oaks, uh, uh, but the the uh, the Adrian's Farmhouse still stands. Uh, and it dates to some, a Dutch immigrant named Albert Adrians, who bought land in Eastern Queens in 1697. Uh, and this house right here, and then of course, five generations of his family lived there and, and, and farmed there uh, too. And as you can see, it's, 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 it's a Dutch colonial style. Um, it's got uh, floorboards and plank floors. Uh, if you go inside, it's got a double pitched roof with high gables. Uh, if you go inside, uh, it's, they, they do a good job of trying to keep, you know, keep it looking the historical way. Um, the, uh, the land, the property there um, is on a, a true farm. If you go out and visit there, you'll, you'll see that they have, uh, they grow everything. You, they grow all kinds of stuff, including grapes for wine. Uh, they have a, a maize maze, a corn maze, labyrinth. They have all kinds of farm animals, uh, et cetera, et cetera, that you can, you can take a hayride. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, so that, uh, the other thing is that uh, there was a belief that this was called the Cornell Farmhouse, but it turns out that the Cornells were a different family that lived about, about a, uh, a half a mile away. Uh, so that is, in fact, the Adrian's ha- uh, uh, Farmhouse, and it dates to uh, Albert Adrian's, who arrived in 1697. Uh, moving right along, that's King Manor. Uh, I think anybody who, uh, who, who uh, loves Queen's history uh, has probably been there. It's right smack dab in, in the middle of King Manor, uh, King, King, uh, Rufus King Park in Jamaica. Um, that picture is taken from 1946, uh, but the, uh, the, house still, the house stands still today, and it looks pretty much just like that. Um, uh, and it all relates to a guy named Rufus King uh, and his descendants. They lived there. It's a three-story. As you can see, uh, there are three chimneys. There's actually a third chimney you can't see, a uh, mansion with clapboard. It was, that one was built in 1730 uh, with an addition made in the 1800s. Now, the King family, were they were incredibly prominent. Um, first of all, they were very successful um, Farmers. I mean, they had everything from apples to corn, peaches, strawberries, and so on, livestock. Uh, they were also uh, ardent abolitionists. And they, even though when they were first living there, uh, slavery was still legal in, the United, in New York State, they refused to. They, they paid a wage to all of the, uh, the workers, some of which were African-Americans and some of which were uh, immigrants from Ireland and Scotland. Um, and uh, then they also were, were big in the abolition movement, trying to end slavery uh, in, in the rest of the, the U.S. Now, Rufus King, the guy, the original guy in this house, uh, was the uh, youngest signer of the U.S. Constitution. Uh, he was also a senator for about 18 years, and he was an ambassador. Um, and uh, uh, he was twice, he twice was uh, the Federalist Party candidate for vice president, and once he even ran for president, although obviously he, he didn't win. Uh, now, he, he had five sons who were all ridiculously uh, overachievers. One was an assemblyman, congressman, and governor. One uh, edited the New York Inquirer and then became president of Columbia College. Another one went to Ohio and founded the Cincinnati Law School. Another one was a World a War of 1812 veteran who moved to New Jersey and became a congressman. And then there was Frederick, who became a doctor who was famous for his lectures on uh, anatomy. 
So it's a very, very prominent um, family uh, that lived in Queens. And it's also worth noting that um, where you, you can visit that still today. And it's, uh, it's on a park named after the same people. Um, it's 11 acres, you know, it's the right, right to the back of where that photo is. There, there are all kinds of soccer fields and other things. Uh, it's, it's, it's right next to the Jamaica Center for Performing, or the Jamaica Performing Arts Center. Uh, and like I say, it, it dates to about 1800, a little bit before 1800. Moving right along, Jacob Rees. Uh, Jacob Rees is famous for writing the book, How the Other Half Lived, uh, and a bunch of other books. Uh, on urban reform, on, on poverty, on, on how to eliminate poverty, and so on and so forth. He lived in Richmond Hill. Uh, the house you see at the left is, is, uh, was a, is a little shed that's on his property where he did all of his writing. And in fact, he wrote the famous book, How the Other Half Lived, right there um, in, that, in that shed right there. Uh, the picture on the, the right, that's his daughter or one of his daughters. Uh, and you can see the houses in the back. Richmond Hill today, it has a, um, a Victorian section. It's actually another historical district uh, where they have all these Victorian houses. And uh, in the back, you can see uh, where, they, where they all are, where, how they were. Obviously, this photo looks like it was taken uh, just as the thaw was starting, like uh, uh, winter was ending. Um, but he lived in Richmond Hill on, on a very beautiful uh, house. Now, unfortunately, the house had um, landmark status, but then a couple of years after it was granted, uh, they realized that uh, the indoor, was, due to water damage that had leaked in, the indoor was dilapidated and the whole structure was compromised. So after being granted landmark status, it then had landmark status taken away from it. Um, which is kind of kind of funny. The other thing is that I don't know if um, if uh, you guys know about Jacob Rees, but he was a, an immigrant from Denmark, and uh, one of the and he's famous for what he wrote about uh, the beach out in Long Island in in, in Rockaway is named after him. But uh, what he he also is responsible for bringing Christmas caroling to the United States. Uh, basically, what happened was Christmas caroling was very popular in Denmark. Uh, one day he was at church before Christmas, uh, a, a church in Richmond Hill, and he realized that one of the women who was always there was not there. And he asked for her and someone said, oh, she's sick. She's in, at home. Later that day, he went to Maple Grove Cemetery, which is in Kew Gardens, where his, his wife is buried. And he used to visit her gravesite a lot. And while there, he realized, you know, why don't we bring, why don't we do this Christmas caroling? Uh, and uh, then he, he went back to the church and he got a bunch of people together and they went to the sick woman's house and they sang Christmas songs to her and it became the absolute rage of the time. Uh, and then the next year they did it again and so on and so forth until, until it kept on going. So that is Jacob Reese's house in, in, in Richmond Hill. Uh, so what we have here uh, are two different houses at two different ends of the Rockaways. On the left-hand side, there is, uh, well, what's a, a, uh, what is a historic uh, district? It's the Far, Far Rockaway Beach Bungalow Historic District. Uh, if you're like me, you grew up hearing stories about people that went to the bungalows over the summer. Um, they are uh, down, the, the, the historic district is down. It starts around Beach 24th and Beach 26th Street. Um, uh, and uh, the strip has about 100 bungalows today. Uh, and uh, it's, it's been on the National Register of Historic Places since 2013. You know, uh, this, the Rockaways, people don't realize this, but before the, the car was uh, mass produced and affordable, uh, people, the Rockaways was kind of like the Hamptons. It was where a lot of the wealthiest people went for the summer. Back then, you know, there was no air conditioning. There was a train stop that, to, that could take you from Manhattan to, to the Rockaways. And so the only place to sort of get sea air, seaside air, and get away from Manhattan for the summer, the easiest way was the, the Rockaways. And so there were all kinds of uh, huge mansions, uh, some of them completely over the top by, by people who had made a lot of money on Wall Street. Um, uh, but uh, the, 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 the bungalow historic district 
Uh, all of those houses are, are basically 25 by 50 feet, or at least the lots are 25, 50 feet. There are, there are common alleyways that separate each dwelling, uh, side hall entrances, which are all kind of fun. The, uh, the heyday for the far Rockaway, this is the more middle class, was in the early 1900s. Uh, uh, these houses that were built on the left were by a guy named Henry Hohauser, who was the same guy who did a lot of the Art Deco uh, stuff in Miami. Um, and at one time, there were about 11,000 bungalows. Uh, their heyday was 1921, uh, 1925. Um, and uh, they were kind of segregated. There was a Jewish section, there was an Irish section, there's an Italian section, kind of like the Catskills was. You know, people talk about the Italian Alps, the Irish Alps, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, what happened with them is uh, really it's the, the, the car becoming mass produced. Uh, people started going further out to Long Island, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and the, the, the bungalows uh, kind of went, uh, they went, they're no longer as, as sought after. Um, to the right is the house that's known as the castle. Uh, you can still, you go there today. Uh, we talked earlier about the castle, which was up in Fort Totten Park. Uh, this is also called the castle. Uh, it is about 120th Street. The guy who, uh, it's owned by a guy named David Selig and he converted it into a, a community use there. So he lives there, but he also, there are all kinds of meditation sections and photo shoots and parties. Uh, you can rent it out. Um, it, uh, it, it dates back to a, an Italian immigrant uh, who, uh, who came over uh, from, I believe, uh, Frank Busta was his name. He came over and he built this, it's a palazzo uh, from Tuscany. The pieces, everything that you see there was brought over from Tuscany in 1912. He owned a restaurant near Wall Street, uh, made a lot of money and he built that waterfront villa. Uh, it was sort of his dream house, uh, which is kind of funny because it's also now the dream house of, of Dave Selig, who always wanted to have a great place where you could also hold community events. Uh, inside right now, the outside, of course, uh, hasn't been changed much. It's still the Italian palazzo style. But inside, he has a finished sauna and a steam room and a yoga studio and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and it's still there. Um, all right. Moving, on, moving right along, thundering along. Uh, what we're seeing right here is uh, Helen Keller. Helen Keller is on the right in the middle of that photo. And on the left is her house. She was uh, born in Alabama, but she grew up mostly in Forest Hills, and she called that house where she lived the Castle on the Marsh. Uh, the, if you see, uh, there's a little kid being held at the bottom uh, in the photo on the right. That is someone named uh, Robert Hoff, who people in Forest Hills might know. He still lives there. He grew up. That's, those are his family members who grew up across the street from Helen Keller. He's a real estate agent, so you might have heard of him, Robert Hoff. He provided this photo. Um, Helen Keller, uh, I guess you, uh, you probably would know, she was like the first woman to graduate from Harvard. Even though she had scarlet fever and she was blind, she learned Braille. Um, and uh, that house, which was called, which she called Castle on the March, was a uh, uh, a hotbed of, of activism. Uh, she co-founded the ACLU. Uh, she was an early uh, supporter and donor of the NAACP. She was always fighting for women's rights and, and women's voting rights. Uh, she was a disability activist, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and she, oh, I'm sorry, she wasn't the first woman. She was the first deaf and blind person to graduate from Harvard. She also graduated magna cum laude. Um, she lived in that house uh, from 1917 to 1938. Uh, it's where she learned Braille and lip reading. Uh, if you remember the story, she had a tutor by the name of Ann Sullivan, who they call the mir miracle worker. Um, and uh, she lived there. They held a lot of fundraisers for all kinds of things there. Uh, and then uh, the house burned down. Uh, you can still go, and the Keller family actually moved to Connecticut where she died. The property is now what you see right there, which is the Reform Temple of, of Forest Hills, which is a very beautiful temple. I've, I've been to bat mitzvahs there before. Um, uh, there is uh, a plaque on the side, which explains how this was uh, where Helen Keller lived, um, et cetera, et cetera. There's also a, a mural uh, 
at the Long Island Rail Railroad overpass in Forest Hills, which is dedicated to Helen Keller, uh, which people might have seen. Uh, so moving down, we're going down to, um, uh, that would be Kew Gardens. Uh, and the man on the right is Ralph Bunch. Uh, he is the first African-American to win a Nobel Peace Prize, uh, which he did in the uh, 1950s. He was famous, he, he did in 1950, sorry, he was famous for, uh, he, he was the undersecretary at the United Nations and he was involved in stuff like uh, the Israel-Palestine conflict. Uh, in the photo right there, he is with the uh, religious leader of Cyprus. Uh, at the time, you know, Cyprus is an island that the Greeks and the Turks have been fighting over. As it is right now, part of it belongs to Cyprus, part of it belongs to Turkey. But he's there, he's seen in that photo, uh, talking about the, 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 the ownership uh, of, uh, of the island of Cyprus. He, uh, he lived in a house which is still there. I think I just took that photo from the street. Um, he bought it in 1952. Uh, people don't know that, well, I'll get into this a little bit later. Um, but um, he lived there until 1971. Uh, and uh, in the photo, I should probably tell you uh, that the person he's with is Archbishop Makarios III, who is the president of Cyprus. And he is in the presidential palace in Nicosia in 1964. Nicosia is the capital of, of Cyprus as we are today. Um, so this is also kind of, I would say this is uh, important for what we're about to see right here, which is Parkway Village, which is actually where Ralph Bunch lived before he moved into that previous house. Technically, they say that Parkway Village is in Briarwood. Uh, it looks to me kind of like Flushing. Uh, it's in basically around the area. It's not far from uh, St. John's. Uh, it's not far from city, uh, from, from Queens College too. Uh, it's a place called Parkway Village. Now, what people don't realize is that the United Nations used to meet in uh, Queens. They used to meet in Flushing Meadow, Coronas Park. In fact, uh, what is now Queens Museum is where the United Nations used to meet. And on the right, you'll see there's a picture of the United Nations in session uh, in what is now uh, Queens Museum. And when uh, what happened basically, there was the, the 1939 World's Fair uh, and uh, they, they kept, basically they, they, the, the internationalness never left, uh, but all of the prominent ambassadors and so forth needed a place to live. And at the time, Parkway Village had been, was, uh, was, was popping up uh, and um, Robert Moses and the mayor, who's O'Dwyer at the time, they basically signed this, uh, this deal that United Nations people could move into uh, this place called Parkway Village, which you see um, at, at the left. Uh, it, it opened in 1947. Uh, it has, uh, it's right next to the Grand Central Parkway, Parsons Boulevard, if you know where that is, Main Street. Uh, and it was an integrated community at a time when really there weren't that many uh, integrated, uh, where, where really uh, there was segregation everywhere. Um, it was built by the same guy, or it was designed by the same guy who did the Waldorf Astoria uh, Hotel. And what you're seeing there are neo-Georgian and modernized colonial style houses uh, with red brick. It's uh, around a public square. The, the, the architectural style or the, the urban layout style is called post-war garden. And it is exactly, if you go to the University of Virginia in Charlottesville, I haven't, but apparently if you go there, you'll see that uh, the exact style is the way they laid out, um, uh, the way they laid out Parkway Village, uh, which of course still exists. But uh, as people probably know, uh, the Rockefeller family gave a lot of money to build the United Nations building that's in Manhattan right now, Turtle Bay. Uh, and then once that happened, uh, all of the uh, the UN people that basically started in, in, in Exodus, and they all uh, and people moved out of Parkway Village, but it's still there, still there today. Um, up in front of me, this is a house. I tell you, when I was walking through this house, I really had that desire to live there. You know, like I've seen a lot of these houses. This one, I was like, oh my god. Uh, it's called the Steinway Mansion, and it is uh, in uh, in Astoria. Uh, we're not far from. The, where Steinway still operates, still makes pianos today. Uh, it actually was not, it doesn't originate from, from the Steinway family. A guy named Benjamin Pike 
who, um, who basically developed uh, uh, eyeglasses or what's used for eyeglasses uh, in early 1800. And so he built this uh, house and it's, it's over the top. It has 27 rooms. It's granite, granite and bluestone Italian villa. It was on a 440-acre state estate, um, and uh, it has 2,285 mansions uh, square feet. Sorry, a slate gable roof, with large bay windows. Uh, this photo was from 1969. It also has like a balustrade. It has this big oct octagon. It has all these court Corinthian leathers. It's got this wonderful library. It's just incredible. Um, but Steinway then bought it uh, in about 1870. Um, and since then, it's had some other owners that had a guy named Jack Hal Halberian. Uh, unfortunately, uh, some undisclosed buyers bought it in 1914. It has landmark status um, and it's listed on the National Register of Historic Places, but it's, it's kind of dilapidated. Uh, it's kind of falling apart. Uh, which is really kind of sad, but it's still there uh, and you can still visit it. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how you would do that now uh, without trespassing, uh, but it is there. Uh, I know that the Greater Astoria Historical Society has been dying to buy it. They want to own it and have their headquarters there. Um, and all right, we're going to do, I think this was probably one of the last ones, but this is the Underdunk House. Um, the Underdunk House, which is located uh, it's technically in Ridgewood. It's right near Ridgewood and, uh, well, Ridgewood in Queens and Bushwick in Brooklyn and Williamsburg and Bushwick uh, in Brooklyn. It is the oldest Dutch colonial stone house, okay, colonial stone house in all of New York City. Uh, it was first built in 1661 and enlarged in 1709. Uh, there was a guy named Paulus van der Ende, and then there was someone named Adrian Underdunk. Uh, who bought it in the 1800s. Uh, it is uh, a beautiful, beautiful um, uh, Dutch colonial stone, as I said, sorry. Uh, it has field stone walls, as you can see. It has a wood shingle gambrel, gambrel roof, as you can also see, a couple of large brick um, chimneys. It has those double Dutch doors uh, and those, those shutter windows, like the ones that you see all over the Catskills. The house was actually abandoned in 1970, and then it was almost destroyed by a fire in 1975. But then people in the neighborhood rose up and they formed the Greater Ridgewood Historical Society, which took it over, uh, and they now run it as a, as a museum. Uh, you can visit it. it, it they offer a, all kinds of, uh, you know, summer events, carnivals and stuff. You can visit it during the winter as well. It's taking, you take a step back into old, uh, what it was like when people were wearing uh, clogs and whatnot. Um, the, um, the interesting thing I have is, is on, to the right, which is, uh, it's called Arbitration Rock, and it's on the property. Uh, and basically, there, there were uh, land disputes uh, between uh, Bushwick and what was called the town of Newton, which is in Queens. Uh, and the, uh, that rock is where they had a line which determined what was in Queens and what was in Brooklyn. Uh, and it's called Arbitration Rock. Uh, it's still there and you can visit. As you can see, they have it uh, protected with a, with a fence. Um, but, uh, and also the, there's, there's, you know, the, the people that uh, are involved in the house say that's Arbitration Rock, that's where it was. And then there are other people that say, no, it was three blocks away. One of those typical fights. But uh, it's still there, Arbitration Rock, you can visit it. It's uh, whether, I, I, I'm, I tend to, 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 to go with the Underdog House people. It is what, uh, where they, they formed the, the boundary between Brooklyn and Queens. Um, and I think that is all I'm gonna talk about today. Like I said, there are 200 photos. I didn't get to include all the houses in this um, because of obvious reasons I could talk forever on this. Um, but that gives you a little idea of uh, what's in the book and also what we have in Queens, if you're a history buff. Many of these places you can still visit. Uh, many of them has, have absolutely tremendous stories. And um, just kind of like the history of, of New York, uh, you know, the, the, there's Dutch, then there's British, and then the Italians and the Germans came, and the uh, African Americans moved from the south up, uh, and then there were planned communities, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's kind of tells the history of Queens. Uh, and I, I can tell you, uh, if you were to read the book or just learn about these houses, 
uh, you walk down the streets or you drive around in Queens and it gives you a complete uh, more profound understanding of, uh, of the borough. Um, so I think that's it. Are we, uh, have I talked too much, John? No, you're good. Um, okay. So what we're going to do now is we're going to switch over to some Q&A. Okay. Um, I'd like to take a moment to explain to those people who are watching uh, that if you'd like to ask Rob a question, um, if you have a YouTube account, just scroll down to find the live chat. Uh, you should be able to see a spot where you can submit uh, text messages and then just uh, ask away. Ask questions here. Um, in the meantime, I have a couple questions that I'd love to ask you. Sure. Um, out of all of these houses, uh, I know it's going to be difficult to to do this, but what's your favorite? <laughs> you know, I'll tell you that's that is that is hard, and I do I do say that some of these houses that I was walking through, I was really like, man, I'd like to live here. Um, the, the the Riker house that we talked about at the beginning, I just I love that. I was like. Hmm, I wonder how much she wants for this house. <laughs> it has an um, absolutely beautiful garden as well. It, yeah, um, and, you know, it's, it, and it's just so, it's got this piece of history. Um, an absolute favorite, that'd be awfully, that's awfully hard to say. Uh, uh, to live in, I don't know, I, I'd love, I'd, prob I'd probably want, jeez, uh, golly, I guess... Maybe the Steinway. It looks like a lot of work, but it is so beautiful, and the inside is so beautiful. Um, but then again, it's not really that close to the subway. Right. Neither is this underdog house right here. Um, so basically, yeah, that's, a, that's a really that's a very tough question because there's so many. Uh, I, I, can I live in all of them? Could I spend a week? There about there are we talk about about exactly 50 houses in the book. So could I spend a week in each house? next year <laughs> <laughs> there you go uh so another question that i have um is what what chunk of information uh that you had to cut out to to fit into the book uh what did you regret the most having to to omit well a lot of them are, are some of the uh the, the back the, the, some of the crazy stories about the crazy people that live there um, and things like that. Like, for example, if you look at this, the underdog house, um, it was, since they were Dutch, uh, the Dutch uh, actually had uh, laws that women could own land and they could inherit land at a time when uh, the rest of the United States didn't have that. And, and a series of, of women, uh, women run families, basically, single moms, just for a couple generations, ran uh, the underdog house and they, they ran it. I mean, there was there was a brewery. There, it was involved in all kinds of businesses um, in the area. You know, stuff like that. There's a house that's not in here um, <clears throat> that uh, has been taken over by the Moonies. You know, the uh, the, the religious group, the Moonies. Uh, that I couldn't get into that story. Um, and uh, there there are a lot of like of like for example of all the little stories I told. There's there's so there's there's behind there's the behind the scenes thing. There's a house in. Elmhurst, which, um, and there's nothing really special about it. It's actually aluminum siding and stuff, but um, it's where uh, prominent members of, of the Polish uh, literary community used to hang out for years and years. And the head of the main, main uh, Polish language magazine and Polish playwrights and Polish painters, all that used to hang out. Um, there's, a, there's a story behind there about that I would have loved to tell and the woman who owned it, who came over from Poland. She was actually part of the effort to, to overturn the Nazis. Uh, she was with uh, who, a guy who was considered the, the Polish president in exile. Um, there, you know, there are a lot of stories like that um, that you just you can't get to because they're, they're, they're only so many words. Right. Uh, we have a question here from Arlene. Uh, is the Vocal Earth House Museum covered in this book? Yes, it is. Um, a couple of good photos, uh, and uh, the, for those who don't know, uh, the right we're in Flushing right here. The next neighborhood over is Murray Hill, uh, and there is a family. There's a place there called the Volker Orth Museum. Uh, it's it's significant because basically German immigrants came, and, and it really gives you a, a, an idea of how Germans and then German Americans lived. 
uh, in the early 1900s. Plus, the family was crazy about horticulture, and it has a garden, that uh, a Victorian garden, and they still uh, tend to the garden as, as they did in those times. They don't use any pesticides. Uh, and they have all kinds of, they, they grow all kinds of uh, fruits and vegetables, and they even have uh, bumblebees. They make honey there, too. Yes, another beautiful uh, Yes, it's garden. in there and it has a couple of photos. Yes. Um, if someone were interested in purchasing their book, uh, your book, where where can we, we find them? And the the Queen's Historical Society's uh, gift shop, perhaps? <laughs> yes. Well, uh, okay, I have a question. I have a question about gay. And that, my question is, does this book make a great gift? And the <laughs> answer, of course, yes. <laughs> Makes a great birthday gift. We got Father's Day coming up. Great Father's Day gift. Great July 4th gift. Great Labor Day gift. Great Hanukkah all eight days. Um, but you can get it. The Queen's Historical Society, where I am right now, uh, you can get it here. Uh, you could also order it. Uh, Arcadia Publishing, I think their website is just arcadiapublishing.com. Uh, you can order it there. Uh, you can go directly to me. Um, uh, I imagine that knowing the way the world works now, I'm sure that there are a bunch of other websites that sell it as well, like Amazon probably sells it. And I know that the Astoria Bookshop in Astoria sells it, Q and Willow, which is the bookshop in Kew Garden, sells it. Um, but I imagine if you just typed in my name, Rob, M-A-C-K-A-Y, and Historic Houses of Queens, a bunch of places would come up. I would ask. Uh, you know, the best the best way to do it, in my eye, mind, is to buy it from a local bookshop or the Queen's Historical Society, a local place that does things for the community that could use the money, that appreciates stuff, you know, that organizes talks like this. Um, but that's it. And, and the other thing is, if you want, I am happy to sign it. I've signed many copies already. I'm happy to sign it. And uh, to build on that, if you'd like to purchase a book through the Queen's Historical Society, right now we are still in the process of adding it to the gift shop uh, registry. But if you want, you can contact me directly at jaronh at queenshistoricalsociety.org. And uh, you can email me and I will uh, go through the process and we can get it purchased for you that way. All right. Any last words before we wrap up today? because we have some more upcoming programs that I'd like to talk about, but I want to make sure that you're, you're all plum tuckered out of ty uh, talking about uh, historic houses. You there, Rob? I'm here. <laughs> Anything else that you want me to sell? Am I plum tuckered out? Yes. No, I, I just say that um, I don't claim to be the world's greatest historian or the world's greatest you know, expert on architecture or anything like that. But this book, what it does is it it, it, trans it tells you about Queens. It tells you, it gives you a feeling through, through stories, you know, through, through, through anecdotes and whatnot. It, it tells you about uh, a lot of the, the what makes Queens special. I mean, uh, Queens today, as everyone knows, we've got more than 2 million people. Uh, we're the most diverse county in the world. Um, but going back 400 years is completely different. And, and if your interests are along sort of like history, demographics, architecture, just stories, I think you might enjoy this book. All right. And I think also if you're interested in those kinds of things, you can head to our website, queenshistoricalsociety.org. Uh, and you can become a member. Uh, you can support your local museums that way. And also, uh, we've got some new exhibits. Uh, we have a new virtual exhibit done by Yuan Huan uh, on uh, bubble tea in, uh, in Queens. So if you follow that link, you'll be able to head uh, to that virtual exhibit. Uh, we also have uh, next week, we have a program with the Culture Pass with the uh, public library system. That's going to be June 12th at noon. Head to culturepass.nyc for more information and uh, find us there to sign up and register for that program. Um, on June 20th, Path Through History, we're doing a program on making flags, uh, a new flag for Queens. Uh, Rob, do you know what the Queens flag looks like? 
I do, and um, I know there's some controversy about whether or not the Mets took colors. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so uh, after that, on June 26th, we've also got an In Your Neighborhood scheduled um, for the history of the Pride Parade here in Queens. Um, so I hope that everybody can come out to see those upcoming programs. Uh, I really appreciate everybody who came out today. I also want to thank Rob McKay for coming out and doing his program with us today. Well, Contraire, thank you, Jaron, and thank you to everyone else. <laughs> so we'll see you next time. Thank you for coming out. Enjoy this uh, lovely weekend. All right. Thank you, everyone.